Hello everyone and welcome to our second episode of At War. Thank you to everyone who tuned in to our last episode about Jammu and Kashmir. Today we're going to be talking about nuclear warfare, strategy and deterrence. And our guest today is Ajaz Heather. Ajaz Heather is executive editor at Indus News where he anchors his own show. He was a Ford scholar at the program in arms control, disarmament and international security at the, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's great. It's always great to be at RSIL. Uh, I actually watched your last uh, episode with uh, Asad and it was great, uh, very informative and I think perfectly timed uh, given what's happening in Occupied and now illegally in ex-Kashmir. Um, I, I was a little amused when, you know, you, you said that you would want to talk about deterrence and nuclear weapons and all of this, because uh, there was a time I did a lot of work uh, in this area. But over the years, I won't say that I am not a deterrence optimist anymore, but uh, so I'm not a de deterrence pessimist, but uh, equally, uh, given a number of other factors, I... Uh, look at deterrence with a pinch of salt okay um, but we can we can discuss that yeah, uh, yeah. as we move along but uh, yeah it's great it's okay great, to be great. Here. and yeah. we're really happy to have you with us to talk about this thank you thank um you. especially because it's such an interesting topic currently and mm -hmm. I, I feel like a lot of my students especially they ask about this um so we're glad that the last one was on Jammu and Kashmir and today we can have a different perspective and different chat about something different um so starting off with what is considered quite a primitive question in this area of law I wanted to just ask you in terms of how much the conversation has already advanced from this point, namely when we talk about the efficacy of nuclear weapons themselves, the received wisdom has really been that Pakistan has not fought a full-blown war with India, with the exception of Kargil, leaving that to the side, which um, a lot, would, uh, many would argue was a very distinct conflict since the acquisition of nuclear weapons. Um, and then the converse is that, you know, there will never be an enduring peace so long as both of these countries continue to prioritize these weapons. And the argument that, you know, you, you won't have a full blown war, but you will have an increase in low level conflict. Uh, so what is your perspective on that? That's actually correct. You know, uh, and it's more or less the same trajectory which we saw during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. It's generally... Um, talked about in terms of uh, instability, stability paradox. So what happens is that, uh, you know, during the Cold War, uh, Central Europe uh, was supposed to be the, the contesting ground. But, and initially, uh, both sides went through a certain kind of trajectory in terms of understanding these weapons and in terms of realizing ultimately that you cannot really use them. Uh, you know, they, they are weapons of mass destruction and there's no real known defense against them. And, uh, and of course, by the time this realization set in, we had already seen the devastation that these weapons could cause. That was Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But there was a sense and nuclear strategy and, and frankly, if you ask me, when you have nuclear weapons, there's no real strategy. I mean, we game theorize about these weapons, but frankly, this is to create a club, a club of experts, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, the day the first bomb was dropped, the next day, Bernard Brody, um, who ultimately wrote a lot about uh, nuclear weapons and missiles and all of that. Uh, he saw the headline in, in the New York Times and he uh, said to his wife, he was then a young uh, professor at uh, Stanford, he, uh, he, uh, sorry, Princeton, and he said to his wife, said, uh, everything that I've written so far about war uh, is, is now irrelevant. You know, more or less that statement. And then, of course, the fact that uh, the idea that now it's not about fighting wars, but preventing them. And so that's the, the foremost thing. That said, it also 
creates so while the center holds the periphery gets destabilized mm -hmm. now in the case of uh, the rivalry between the united states and the soviet union uh, the periphery was across the globe multiple areas africa latin america and the rest of it and this was a this was a clash of ideologies if you will uh, capitalism and communism and so both sides had their proxies um, there were lo lots of covert activities that went on and there were groups that uh, fought each other in in various uh, states civil wars and you know that kind of thing so so that was the stability instability uh, paradox so the center held that's where you realize that nothing really can be done uh, because both sides are capable of inflicting punishment that is unacceptable and if you go through the i don't know you might have uh, watched 13 days which was about the cuban missile crisis mm -hmm. it's been talked about and one of the reasons ultimately um it did not uh, result in a catastrophe was because there was a realization and khrushchev wrote two letters there was a hard letter there was a soft letter kennedy was also you know talking to his generals and his cabinet and ultimately uh, kennedy uh, realized and this was uh, because of the push by tommy thompson who was then the us ambassador to uh, to moscow to respond to khrushchev's soft letter because he wants to save face we don't want any further uh, escalation so let's play it uh, you know coolly and that's how the crisis uh, ultimately uh, got resolved there were other instances also but there was a general sense that these are not weapons that you can trifle with um now in our case we don't have proxies around the globe so in our case what we have witnessed uh in terms of instability a crisis okay uh you know for one reason or another lots of people say that kargil happened because pakistan thought that uh the nuclear weapons at the at the higher level uh of war um held the balance but that frankly uh, is not a fact uh, by then although we were tested but by then no one really had an understanding of how this works and uh, kargil was something that was an aberration so uh the balance has overall held i e we have not had a full blown war but we have had multiple crises and now the conversation frankly is about and i'm sure you know this this conversation happened during all these crises um most recently the indian aggression against pakistan um trying to hit a target in in balakot which is pakistan mainland now the conversation is is it possible to have these short sharp uh you know strikes mm -hmm. whether you call them surgical strikes whether you call them fire raids or whatever is it possible to have them because what happens when the side that has been aggressed against retaliates like we did after balakot operation swift retort initially was supposed to hit four targets in occupied and illegally annexed kashmir later it was decided that in order not to go for escalation but also to show resolve that in the event of aggression against us we will retaliate we will go in we'll you know lock in the targets but then drop the the payload just slightly away from them uh, you know that that whole mig 21 episode of course uh, was a bonus uh, for us in the sense that we uh, we shot it down and uh, 
we also possibly damaged a Su-30 uh, MKI. But we're not claiming that because we don't have the debris of that plane. Um, India, of course, came up with that sheer nonsense about shooting down an F-16 and all of that. But that was the safe face. Um, and of course, uh, Narendra Modi used the episode to his great advantage domestically and, uh, and you know, won the election uh, on back of that. Yeah, um, I think it's really interesting the way you you opened with, you know, I used to write a lot about this. I used to be, you know, maybe not an optimist and I'm now not a pessimist. I was reading about your encounter with Robert McNamara as well and, and how much that affected you as well. When we talk about how... Well, you've read that article. I have, yes. Okay. Um, when we talk about there not being a real nuclear strategy, um, we do hear all of these kind of terminology, like strategic terminology thrown around, like this country or that country has a no first use policy or doesn't. And Pakistan has long been criticized like NATO for not having a no first use policy. Um, and India has always maintained that up until very recently where it has said, um, I think Modi in 2014 said that we're gonna rethink it. Again, the defense minister very recently said that we're not, we're gonna rethink this entire policy. Um, they haven't, there haven't been any developments in that regard, but there's been a lot, as is always the case with India, there's been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of rhetoric. Um, so are we in for a regional reconfiguration in terms of how the use of that those weapons are perceived were India to change that policy? Right. So. No first use. Let me put this straight on the table uh, before we uh, talk about it any further. No first use is merely a political declaration. Okay. Now, again, if we go back to the Cold War, NATO, as you just mentioned, has always had a first use policy, still does. The Warsaw Pact, on the other hand, uh, did not have a first use policy. And it was generally considered that since the Warsaw Pact forces are conventionally, you know, uh, stronger uh, and and have higher numbers, therefore NATO forces needed to rely on first use. Interestingly enough, when the Berlin Wall came down, and um, these people had access to classified and top secret documents uh, with reference to the operational plans of the Warsaw Pact forces, they found that their entire war planning in the event of a conflict in Central Europe was pegged on first use. Oh, okay. So, you know, uh, one uh, scholar, late scholar, Sir Michael Quinlan, uh, I recall very vividly, uh, this was after we had tested and, you know, uh, I used to be a member of the IAWS at that time. So there were a series of conferences and um, we were in Mauritius and uh, you know, there was this entire session, there were the Indians, the Pakistanis, the, the British officials and the Americans also. And so this, this discussion came up about first use and no first use. And so Michael said, no first use is for the birds, okay. right? Um, you mentioned yourself uh, that the Indians um, have long, uh, basically, uh, and this has now come out in statements also, that there is no such thing as a, as a no, uh, no first use for them. Uh, it's not an operational uh, declaration. Now, if you want to make it an operational declaration, and I was just, I, you know, before we uh, started, I, was, I looked up something that I had written on this. Uh, so there is this Chinese uh, strategist, Li Bin. He, years ago, uh, you know, as part of this discussion, he basically uh, laid down four uh, benchmarks. Uh, one is about the force size, you know. Uh, is that means is the force configured for first or retaliatory uh, strike? Then there's the force composition, you know, which deals with tactical nuclear weapons and the rest. Then is the accuracy of weapons, especially the the what we call the circular error probable uh, of a missile. How accurate the missile is, you know. Okay. 
um, and then of course the conventional force is is the conventional force strong enough uh, for a state to say well you know we are going to uh, go for no first use but it's not just about the four benchmarks mm -hmm. these benchmarks also need to be verified and there is no way that you can verify this you know also so if if you could actually if state y and state x locked in an adversarial uh, relationship if in theory state y were to say that i believe in no first use yeah and you can verify my operational commitment to no first use on the basis of these benchmarks mm -hmm. then of course you can say well you know operationally this state is operationally not in terms of political declaration there is right. there is a huge difference between the two that operationally it's wedded mm -hmm. to no first use mm -hmm. no so it's it's not about launch on warning it's not about launch under attack it's launch after attack you know uh, and and these benchmarks are not verifiable so therefore the issue of first use and no first use is a specious debate uh, okay. as far as um, the reality is concerned mm -hmm. so then based on that do you think that the mere declaration of no first use then gives those states um a kind of push to build up their conventional uh arms and their com conventional means of warfare um no you see so look uh in in terms of the the broader sort of comparison between conventional capabilities it is definitely yeah. uh, stronger which incidentally does not mean that in the event of specific operations uh it can have a walkover on pakistan or that pakistan cannot retaliate enough because it can mm -hmm. uh, our defense expenditure is you know way way less than india's but mercifully uh, we have invested um judiciously in systems and platforms uh which have served us well so it's actually the system and the platform that you have and then your operational plans and your training with reference to those operational plans and the mission you know so what we saw in um uh, that that morning uh on 27th february we saw that when our strike package went um it we controlled the comms to the extent that the uh caps that the iaf were flying uh those pilots uh had gone deaf and blind because we were controlling the comms okay. and and so my point being that we have uh trained according to our requirements mm -hmm. and uh if if there is force concentration in a particular area then we can give it as good as we can get uh, and perhaps more and as a matter of fact along the line of control also um, the policy is quid pro quo plus if you recall and it's now uh, public knowledge uh, lots of people have reported on this after we shot down the the meg and after we had you know uh, showed resolve the indians threatened missile strikes and uh, our response was well uh, that's not a very uh, smart thing to do but in the event that you want to do it then please remember that for every one missile that you fire at us we'll shoot three 
uh, targets mm-hmm. in india so my point is and and it's a so so just going back to uh, what i was saying about the conversation that there are crises um the modi government unfortunately has tried to uh, you know push a muscular uh, policy uh, thinking that uh, short sharp uh, you know aggression against pakistan but pakistan will probably not retaliate or there's going to be a lot of international pressure on pakistan and so on and so forth and that that that's actually true also but for instance uh, after balakot also the phones started ringing well you know nothing has happened so you might not really want to retaliate we said no that's not going to happen because they have aggressed against us and we will retaliate and we will retaliate at a point in time of our choosing which is what we did the problem with uh, a threat of missile strikes is that there is no known way of knowing for any country whether the incoming missile has a strategic warhead or it has a tactical warhead so when that happens you entering into uh, you know what i would call the terra incognita because it's unknown territory and um, then you can either what we say nuclear strategy you can either fail deadly which means that if the incoming missiles uh did not have strategic warheads but you retaliated with a strategic strike then you were failing deadly or you can fail impotent which means that the incoming missiles right. had the strategic warheads but you responded with a tactical strike and you you got you know uh, degraded in terms of your uh, command and communications channels and the rest of it so therefore the conversation now even with reference to crises is how to resolve them is force the way to do it and uh, it's very clear that you know use of force is not the way to go about it yeah. and i think that is a message that needs to be uh conveyed to the world very clearly uh with reference to india's current uh you know uh, muscular policy or current you know attempts to sort of destabilize uh the entire security environment in south asia and uh, we are not the only like the pakistan and india yeah. are not the only two countries yeah yeah uh, there are other states and uh you know they have they've done nothing wrong mm-hmm. why should they suffer simply because a bunch of loonies has been democratically elected in india yeah yeah so i think this is a, and and frankly i mean the government of pakistan has been conveying this message repeatedly you recall um uh the last one uh foreign minister was in dubai and it uh, it was he actually did a press of there and said that there was evidence that the indians were planning something so i think uh this is this use of force or this thought that there can be a limited action um and there is no possibility of it spiraling um is something that you cannot really put your faith in yeah you know yeah. that said the fact that we said that we are going to you know strike back and then of course the 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 deterrence umbrella forced india to hold its hand so so there is that sense you know at the back of the mind you realize that that's not where you want to go mm-hmm. yeah. so so my uh, contention is that in terms of lower order attacks if india persists with its unfortunate policy um pakistan will have to establish deterrence conventionally right so, because as far as the higher order attacks are concerned uh, the nuclear weapons are there but for the lower order attacks we will have to uh, establish deterrence because deterrence is you know you can't take a snapshot view of it it's got to take a longitudinal design yeah. so it's a trajectory so state x tries to do 
something once, mm-hmm. fails, tries it again, fails, tries it again, fails. And so these are the experiences that then begin to uh, establish deterrence, even conventionally. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting point, especially when we look at February 2019. Um, and when we looked at the airstrikes and when we looked at even Abhinandan coming as the POW and the way we sent him back, um, it's very interesting for me when we mock Indian media a lot. But when I look at it, when both sides can claim a win, the deterrent value of that is, is really, really important. So even though we, we you know, I, I mean, Indian, Indian media is really ripe for, rock, for mocking. Um, I was wondering... In that sense, how it comes to pass that a media which is um, saying that something that is a failure is a win would actually play into uh, Indian politicians being less likely to to use force in order to get a win. And I think I kind of saw that play out again in China and India. And I, I wanted to pivot to that, to the wider region as well, because we've talked about the strategy between India and Pakistan. And it's quite different when we look at India versus China um, and the, the minor conflict that we had in Ladakh. Um, so do you think that... Um, Sorry, uh, there will be a reorientation in terms of how India pl- India does pull away from China and focuses on uh, focuses on China, not Pakistan. Sorry, as a primary security threat in the neighborhood, given that China is being so aggressive. Well, uh, look. Uh, firstly, China is not being aggressive. Okay. Uh, I'll just explain why I'm saying that. A this this entire thing about the the line of actual control uh, goes back to the 50s. And um, Neville Maxwell has written an excellent book on this, uh, detailing uh, the various moves, um, the resistance by Pandit Nehru to actually talking to the Chinese, despite the fact that, you know, Zun Lai and others were saying that let's, you know, uh, figure this out. But Pandit Nehru was relying on, uh, as a legacy state from the British Raj, was relying on, you know, maps which the Chinese were not prepared to accept. Anyway, that's going to be a long uh, discussion. But uh, this particular move by uh, China has to do with India's illegal annexation of Jammu and Kashmir, which is disputed territory. Uh, Very recently, the UN Secretary General in his first press conference of 2021 has made it very clear that this is disputed territory. He also talked about, uh, you know, his good offices and mediation. So he has made it very clear that Indian move is completely illegal. Okay. Now, Ladakh uh, is also of concern to China. Now, after this illegal annexation, Modi's right-hand man, Amit Shah, stood up in the parliament Lok Sabha and talked about uh, giving blood and getting Ladakh uh, uh, back from, you know, excitement back from uh, from China. Mm -hmm. The Chinese were obviously uh, looking at all this. And if you go back to the statement that the Chinese foreign ministry issued, on 6th August 2019, made it very clear that China does not accept uh, this, uh, what India calls its internal administrative, uh, you know, uh, action. So, um, China is, is uh, China, China's economy is five times that of yeah. India. Uh, China in 1962, um, beat India militarily. Uh, it's it's amazing the desperate letters that Pandit Nehru was shooting off to then US President John F. Kennedy. Um, Bruce Rydell has a, has a book on this, uh, JFK's Forgotten War, and he details uh, all this and the other sources also. I actually have copies of those letters uh, which Pandit Nehru uh, sent to uh, JFK. Uh, Chinese unilaterally withdrew and that's how it came to an end. So there is a, there's, a, there's a certain psychological dominance also uh, 
there because uh, China beat them. They also realized since 2015, China uh, under Xi Jinping has also embarked on a very ambitious military modernization program. And uh, the details of that, uh, whether in terms of aerial platforms or land forces or uh, the uh, PLA Navy, are fascinating. And they are modernizing and preparing for a possible, in, you know, for China's defense, for a possible conflict with the United States. Yeah. yeah. So the kind of technologies that they are integrating, mm -hmm. uh, the cyber capabilities, the, you know, their capabilities in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, the use of artificial intelligence and the rest of it. Yeah. So the Chinese military is in a different league. And India knows that. Yeah. You mentioned the Indian media. Now, <laughs> compare the, you know, the hue and cry uh, that they make on their shows when it is with reference to Pakistan and how subdued yeah, they were exactly. with reference to the Ladakh uh, skirmishes. Now the Chinese are, India has now also started talking about uh, military, uh, you know, interoperability between PLA and the Pakistani military. Of course, we've been exercising. Of course, there's, there's you know, these are two allied states and we will. Uh, we've been doing military exercises, uh, land exercises also, uh, you know, aerial exercises also. And of course, you pick up best practices. You you see how the other side is operating. The other side sees how you operate. And so you get a sense of, you know, how uh, a certain level of uh, jointness can be achieved. So I don't think there's any need for uh, any Pakistani to be or a Chinese to be apologetic about the fact that, you know, we, we do this together. It makes eminent sense that we do it together. So, so but, you know, the, the Indians are using this uh, for their domestic benefit. Uh, and they have long considered China as the primary threat. But it is only uh, since the Ladakh events that they have operationally begun to reorient. Uh, you know, this is a pivot to the north. Uh, and uh, recently, they have actually, uh, they used to have three strike corps against Pakistan. Uh, one core, two core, and 21 core. So recently, uh, they, they've reoriented one of their strike corps, one core, to north. So two infantry divisions of that corps are now uh, going to be uh, operating there. So obviously they would need to retrain and reconfigure and the rest of it because you know it's very different fighting there than yeah. fighting in the plains or in the desert. And the one of the the armored divisions is going to uh, stay back and uh, be used as a strategic reserve either for one of one of the two strike wars, wherever it will be required. So now, yes, a conceptually they had this this thing about China being the primary threat, but operationally, they hadn't done much with reference to that. Now they're doing that. Mm -hmm. So th the line of actual control now is a hard manned line. Uh, it's going to be round the clock, three sixty five days. Right. And that's going to cost a lot. It is costing a lot. Um, so let's see how that unfolds. The Chinese, uh, what they needed to do at this point, they have already done that. Mm -hmm. They are in what is referred to as a you know superior strategic orientation. And they don't need to do any, anything more right now. Uh, they physically dominate the area and they psychologically dominate the area. Of course, there are points along the line of actual control uh, because it's not just Ladakh. There's the central, uh, you know, uh, LSE also. Then there's the Eastern Front also. 
where it's, it's a very long line, kind of goes like this, you know. So, so there are points where the Indians would be in an advantageous position, but by and large, the Chinese already have a military ecosystem there. Mm-hmm. India is now developing that military ecosystem. But they still uh, have, uh, you know, uh, more fighting formations uh, arrayed against Pakistan than against China. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that's where the situation stands. Yeah, I wonder about China because um, we're seeing them now come out really as a military power, uh, whereas previously they were they were focused more on economics. And I think primarily in the South China Sea, we're going to see so much more tit for tat conflict with the U.S. And I wonder whether China is falling into the whole Thucydides trap that the U.S. has fallen in with China, where they're seeing the rise of a great power and they want to um, you know, overpower it immediately. And is China doing the same with India? It's interesting that you talk about this because, yeah, you know, uh, Graham Allison did this whole sort of project at Harvard, uh, looking at the last 500 years and, you know, 14, or six, or is it 16, called, uh, four of them did not result in war and 12 days, 16, 16 cases. Um, but what I find interesting is that, uh, in fact, um, on uh, 14th February, uh, we do this think fest. Uh, I'm sure you, uh, yeah, we, we, yeah. we've done this physically also, but now we, we try and, you know, we did it online last year. And this time we have some sessions that, that are going to be online and some will be physically held. So I'm, I'm going to be in conversation with uh, Professor John Mearsheimer. Okay. And uh, Mishaima, as you know, as a structural realist, um, thinks that this clash is inevitable mm-hmm. between China and the United right. States. So the the security trap that you're mm-hmm. talking about, the term that you know Professor Ellison uh, coined, uh, it'll be interesting uh, because uh, as I wrote to him, as I said, you know, uh, I'm a structural realist myself, but I'm I'm going to wear the devil's you know, sort of being be be the devil's advocate and and challenge the the determinism that inheres in structural realism. Um, yes, it's going to be. Look, there is China, uh, and I. You know, when I do my program, I often have Chinese experts uh, on the program. One thing that I picked up, and I'm talking about different people coming to my program uh, yeah. on different topics. But there's a, there's a motif with reference to never again mm. will China be subjugated by anyone. You know, their experience, the opium right. wars and the, and the Japanese and, you know, the, and the Western militaries, it's, so, it's, it's sunk so deep in their psyche that whatever they do um, is is referenced back to that time when China was uh, was being treated as 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 a you know a, a nobody. So and they're very clear that that's not going to happen now ever. Mm-hmm. And I think much of what they're doing now, for instance, during Deng Xiaoping's time, uh, the idea was to develop but stay below the radar. Okay. With she, it's well, you know, we have arrived. Yeah, yeah. And since we have arrived, um, we, we're going to project our right. arrival. <coughs> Excuse me. And connectivity, a lot of connectivity. I mean, um, they are now central to this, uh, uh, the largest trading block in, in the world. Mm-hmm. And then they have the BRI and CPAC, of course, as everyone knows and talks about as the flagship of, of that. Uh, so I think India realizes that. And the other thing is for India, if it wants uh, to move out of the cooperative framework, which it, it had with China, uh, because it, it tried to sort of, you know, uh, leave the issue of line of actual control aside and just trade with China and generally to keep relations on an even keel. But if 
now the trajectory is going to go in a different direction, then the choice for India would be how long can it retain its strategic autonomy? You know, they keep talking about strategic uh, uh, There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, bluster also in that. Uh, they haven't always been strategically autonomous, but nonetheless. So how long can they retain their strategic autonomy? Because in the event of things hotting up, India would need the United States. Mm. And so, so when you call upon another state with which you are now increasingly uh, you know, aligned, then there are no free lunches. Mm. <laughs> the Americans yeah. would also ask for something in return. So that's an area which is kind of, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, it'll become clearer as we uh, move further along this trajectory. Uh, it'll also depend on how the new US administration looks at India. Um, and if and when India gets another government, which is not an RSS government, yeah. how India would uh, look at uh, US relations and relations with China, all of that is still uh, in the realm of the unknown. Mm -hmm. But from what one can see at this point, um, it seems that India will uh, get closer to the United States. Uh, it will have to uh, basically um, uh, become a junior partner mm -hmm. and once that happens then the the idea of strategic autonomy goes out the window right right yeah and I, I I find it really interesting to look at the ways in which the US does try and prop up India as kind of like a stalwart to China yeah. and the fact that India is kind of hedging its bets because at the same time it does want to close the relationship with the US but its main weapons imports still come from Russia. So trying yeah. to maintain that kind of balance. No, so you have a problem there, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with the SCARTSA thing with reference to the S-400 A2 AD system. Now, the Americans are okay with the legacy systems because they know that India has long been relying on uh, uh, Russia. But now with, uh, you know, four foundational agreements between the United States and uh, India, uh, the U.S. is not particularly happy with uh, India acquiring a system which um, the U.S. thinks is a is a threat, and and especially you know with like look at uh, Turkey. I mean, Turkey was part of the F thirty uh, five program. They were manufacturing some of the uh, components of that, but the U.S. separated Turkey from that, and you know, Turkey is under you know cuts of sanctions now. So these are issues that India will have to yeah. look into um, in terms of, as far as, for instance, I mean, the Indians are also getting uh, these, uh, you know, general issue uh, assault rifles from Russia. And uh, it's, um, I think it's, it's the AK-103, which for the Indian order, has been designated as AK-203. The, the Americans aren't particularly uh, interested in that. Uh, mm. It's not a big ticket item. And uh, if the Indians want it, and if the Indians start manufacturing it in India, well, that's fine. But uh, other platforms and systems uh, that are sophisticated, is a completely different ball game altogether. Yeah, and I kind of um, my last question uh, kind of brings it back to Pakistan and India in terms of their relationship with the U.S. when it comes to nuclear safety. Uh, so we don't have the same, even though we have a Hindutva fascist government who is saying that we're going to change that policy. We don't have the same kind of indignation shown to. India, as it is to Pakistan, India does have a very different system. It has shared custody. So scientists, politicians and policymakers are all involved in the shared custody of their nuclear weapons. But when it comes to Pakistan, um, 
now we have a growing indignation on the part of Pakistani policymakers towards Western concerns about nuclear safety. Um, and I, I did find it very funny when it came to the capital riots that, you know, Pakistanis yeah. were tweeting and saying, we're very worried about the safety of America's nuclear weapons. Um, so do you think that the indignation is justified or do you think that there is a case to answer for when it comes to Pakistan and its previous dealings with North Korea, Libya um, or Iran? Look, uh, one can go into details of that, um, but let me just say um, that uh, no other nuclear weapon state has done more mm. in the last 20 years than Pakistan in terms of safety and security. of. The, and let me just give you, a, I actually put down some of this so that, you know, because there are uh, many points. Now, okay. So there's a 30,000 strong, uh, specially uh, recruited and trained and equipped force for nuclear security. And uh, this force has different components. Uh, for instance, there are the uh, forces which protect static installations. There are forces to protect convoys, carrying sensitive materials and counterintelligence teams. They also have a rapid response team with an you know, operations center manned round the clock. Mm -hmm. um, and it's integral aviation resources to airlift this force anywhere in the country within 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, there's a purpose-built training academy. Uh, PNRA has established, uh, uh, you know, uh, NISAS-9 is a National Institute of Safety and Security. There's an emergency response center uh, there are also regional centers for immediate response in case of a radiological emergency. So uh, then there have been uh, the personnel reliability programs, background checks. Mm -hmm. um, then as far as the, the safety of the wards are concerned, there are uh, you know, systems uh, which make them safe. Uh, we have never had any incident of broken arrow, you know. Uh, one can cite a number of incidents in the United States, elsewhere yeah. where, uh, you know, there have been mistakes made. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, uh, you know, the adversaries would, or they continue to raise this issue purely for uh, political reasons. Right. Uh, but, but the reality is very different. Mm -hmm. The reality is that Pakistan uh, has done whatever is humanly possible. Now, having said that, uh, nothing is ever foolproof. You know, as we've seen in the case of the United States, uh, China and the so so Soviet Union and now the Russian Federation, the closed system. So even if something happens, or North Korea, for instance, no one would know that this has happened. But I'm talking about countries where things do uh, somehow, sometimes nuts and bolts information, but they do tend to come out. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, lots of uh, incidents uh, and accidents in, in nuclear installations in India. Uh, there was the, remember the Bhopal gas leak uh, thing. And, and so this has happened. So nothing is foolproof. Yeah. For as someone said that for every proof, there's always a fool. But whatever is possible. And, and then this is not something where you, you know, sit on your laurels. This is a process. You review it, you know, constantly. And wherever it's, it's like the, you know, the upgrades that we get right. for phones. And mm -hmm. so wherever there is, uh, for instance, Apple realizes that there is something that needs to be patched up because this is a weak point. Mm. Uh, they will do it. So similarly, in this case, you consistently and continuously review these procedures and processes and then wherever you think that something needs to be strengthened yeah. or reviewed, that's done.
Yeah. Okay. Great. So it's good to know they're in good hands. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for taking out the yeah, time yeah. and talking to us about nuclear safety. Thank you to I everyone. I love a good cup of tea also. Yeah. Okay. Great. We have great yeah. coffee in this office as well. Uh, thank you to everyone for tuning in at home, and I hope you do tune in for future episodes. Uh, we're hopefully going to have even more more interesting topics for you as well. Thank you so much.